Welcome to Hot Chips 33. Tutorial 1 Machine Learning Performance and Challenges. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining me at the uh, Hot Chips tutorial on machine learning. I wanted to start with a couple of contextual and motivational remarks. I, and, I'll, and, and really to start with uh, thanking my fantastic co-chairs, uh, Natalia and Bartico. We've pulled together a fantastic set of speakers to help everyone uh, come away much smarter and wiser about machine learning, and thanks to the speakers as well for sharing their time and their expertise. Um, I think if you look at the program of hot chips in general, you'd see that one of the themes is hardware software co-design, right? We have a program of uh, main conference papers that includes specialized system architectures for everything from molecular dynamics, and, uh, video transcoding to networking, and of course, machine learning one of the hot topics du jour. The motivation for this tutorial is that Hot Chips is a conference of architects that have tremendous strength in hardware and uh, hardware system design. But hardware and software co-design must balance the hardware and an understanding of what hardware can do physically with what software and real world workloads demand. And so the focus of this tutorial is really helping to understand what is the software side of the equation for machine learning. Uh, we have talks lined up that will give an overview and a background of common workloads in machine learning to help dispel myths like convolutional neural networks are really all that there is in machine learning. It turns out it's a vastly more diverse field. And understanding that will help architects design better systems. And from there, we'll pivot into talking about MLPerf, the industry standard benchmarks to measure performance, and how that helps us gain insight, as well as, with all benchmarks, their approximate representation. So what are the shortcomings of these representations? What is done in the real world? How are optimizations for MLPerf general? How might they not be? And then looking at sort of the frontiers of machine learning at new and emerging and very challenging workloads. So that's the, the agenda we have in front of us today. And my goal is, and the goal of my co-chairs, is that everyone who attends will walk away, you know, better able to look at the problem of machine learning from a hardware software co-design perspective. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And I'm thrilled to turn things over to Natalia, my co-chair, who will be leading things this morning. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again. Uh, we will start our first session of the Hot Chips uh, conference and the first machine learning tutorial. Uh, the, I am Natalia Vasilova. I am director of product at uh, Cerebrus and uh, have passions about machine learning and uh, co-design of uh, hardware for deep learning, especially. So during the first session, as uh, David mentioned, we will give you an overview of uh, deep learning workloads, uh, computational characteristics, and what makes them special. And hopefully, it will get, give you some insights uh, what questions to ask when you design different hardware chips uh, for this architecture, and talk about benchmarks. So the very first talk will be given by Paulus Mitsikiewicz. Uh, he is a senior distinguished engineer at NVIDIA, where he heads up an architecture group focusing on deep learning, precision, sparsity, and scale out. And his previous roles include uh, perception deep learning engineer at Zoox, DevTech at NVIDIA, where he focused on HPC computes on GPUs, as well as uh, assistant professor of computer science at Armstrong Atlantic State University. He holds a PhD in computer science from University of Central Florida. 
So Paulus uh, will kick us off describing the field of deep neural networks. He will talk about different types of neural networks, what are specific uh, features of those, uh, what are specific computational patterns, and hopefully it will set you up for the rest of the tutorial to understand better what are those um, algorithms that we try to design hardware for. Uh, after the session, we will uh, be hosting a live Q&A, uh, but I welcome everyone to join the Slack channel uh, dedicated to this talk and post your questions during the talk. I will be monitoring the Slack and uh, we'll pick up the most upvoted questions to be answered live at the end of the session. And if not all of the questions will be answered, we'll ask Paulus to answer them offline later. So welcome once again, and with that, Paulus, up to you. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, I guess we'll get started. So as uh, David and Natalia mentioned, the first talk will be uh, an attempt to give a quick survey and overview of various neural network architectures that are in use today and talk a little bit about their computational characteristics. So uh, the outline for the talk, um, we'll start with a high-level overview of how a neural network operates, you know, very high level. Um, we'll take a look at a few sort of fundamental layer categories, um, and then we'll take a look at various input data categories, And uh, because oftentimes the neural network structure and operation really kind of follows the input data that is fed into the neural network. And we'll try to summarize things at the end. Okay. So uh, looking at a high level, uh, a neural network is made up of a set of layers where the data flows from the input to the output. So in the little diagram here below, input is sort of the matrix in gray here. We have a sequence of layers in different colors. And as input data arrives sort of on the left, for training, it will flow through various layers uh, left to right towards the output. Then a loss would get computed, and then data would flow back. Well, really, gradients would flow backwards, and weights would be, would be updated. For inference, uh, data flows only forwards. Uh, and data traditionally is really sets of vectors uh, which oftentimes form matrices. And we'll see this pattern come up over and over and over. That whatever the input is on the application side, by the time the neural network operates on, a, on the data, it has to be turned into a set of vectors. And each layer essentially just consumes its inputs, performs some operation, and produces the outputs. So if we look at the various compute uh, characteristics of various layers, I sort of divide them into three rough categories. We have layers where computing an output element requires computing a dot product. And we'll see a number of those layers. Traditionally, those will be matrix multiplies. So in machine learning, sometimes they'll be called fully connected layers or linear layers or projection matrices. But as you can imagine, you're computing dot products. Uh, convolutions actually also fall into this category because they are just sets of uh, dot products that can be formulated uh, to the hardware to look like matrix multiplies. Then we have uh, reductions. I'll assume the audio is still going. Um, and uh, for reductions, the output uh, element computation involves reducing or summing up input elements uh, of a given tensor over some dimension. So operations would be such as you know, computing an average, computing the sum of all elements, computing a norm of a tensor. Um, and these oftentimes come up in uh, loss functions as well as various normalizations, such as batch normalization, layer normalization, and others, you know, instance norm. Uh, traditionally, these really compute the mean and the standard deviation over some tensor dimension, and based on that, normalize the data. But that's sort of the compute pattern. Uh, you actually now have to look at a group of numbers and effectively combine them or reduce them. Right? So that's less math intensive than dot product based computations. And finally, we have element-wise operations, where you have an input tensor that comes into the layer, and the operation really gets per performed point-wise. So to produce an output element, you really look at just the corresponding input element, or maybe the corresponding input elements in a few uh, input tensors, let's say if you're doing point-wise addition of two tensors and so forth. Um, so again, examples here would include uh, many nonlinearity functions, which usually are just point-wise. So you apply ReLU, per point, uh, or GALU, or sigmoid, and many other functions. Um, Pointwise tensor add is another example here. So if we look at these three categories, the first category, dot product based ones, um, operations, that's where you can get math intensive or arithmetically intensive uh, layers, right? Because oftentimes you end up with matrix multiplies, and as those mu matrix multiplies get larger, um, you're more math intensive and having a lot of math throughput on your chip 
is helpful. Uh, the next two categories are much more memory limited because you're doing very few operations per byte or very few math operations per byte. So usually you try to saturate memory bandwidth or you try to keep uh, the intermediate data somewhere on, uh, on chip. So moving forward, so that was the categori categorization of layer operations. Um, now if we look at the categori categorization of uh, input to the neural network, uh, we'll use that to actually break down the various neural networks that we'll see. So at a highest level, let's say there's you no know, regular structure inputs and sort of irregular or unstructured inputs. So regular structure would be things like 1D data, we know, where your input is really 1D uh, array. You will get this with text, audio, things like stock prices over time, temperature over time, sort of any sort of sequence-based data. But if you think about text, usually it's going to be a sequence of words, sentences, and so on. Audio also is going to be a sequence of amplitudes and frequencies. Um, 2D regular structure, well, the most popular example here are images, right? And images are 2D grid of pixels. Um, 3D would be MRI volumes and so forth. So all of these data sets have, or inputs have regular structure to them, potentially some spatial relationships. Um, irregular unstructured uh, inputs include things like graphs, uh, where you have nodes and edges connect some nodes, so they're no longer nice and regular like, let's say, images are, or sequences. Uh, point clouds uh, from LiDAR and other sensors, as well as sets of attributes which come up in uh, recommended networks. So, and we'll delve into more detail uh, right now, actually. So if we look at the unstructured data, so we'll sort of start from the bottom and we'll work our way up from the previous slide. Um, let's look at unstructured data where you, all you have is a set of attributes. So an input is really a to, to a neural network, is a vector formed from all the attributes. Uh, and the network itself after that is an MLP or multi-layer per perceptron, and we'll delve into those details in a moment. Uh, and an example application that we'll use are recommendation neural networks, where they take an, a bunch of information about the various items and the users, and try, they try to make recommendations. For example, you know, what movie to watch next on YouTube, Netflix, or some other service, or song to play on Spotify, and so forth. And typical output from a neural network is either a scalar value, so some probability that an item is relevant or interesting to the user. Uh, could be a vector, um, say an embedding vector, to search through the items later on, and so on. So let's take a look deeper look at the uh, attributes that get really fed into the neural network. There's really two kinds. There are numerical attributes and categorical. So numerical attributes uh, may undergo some normalization, but they already are numbers uh, they, that have inherent meaning to the application. So they can readily become an input vector um, to the neural network. So examples of such attributes could be, let's say, connection bandwidth. If you're watching you know, a video online, the recommendation service may actually make different recommendations based on the bandwidth of your connection. Uh, weight, price for different items, and so forth, right? So things that have numerical uh, meaning and make sense to operate on as numbers. Categorical features or attributes are things like user age group, movie ID, user ID, uh, and so on, you know, location of the user. These don't really have a direct numerical meaning to the application. They might have an ID identifying a user, identifying an item, um, identifying a movie, and so forth. But, you know, let's say if a user belongs to age group three, that doesn't really mean that that's, you know, more useful to the application than user age group four. So three versus four, there's really no inherent meaning to the application. Thus, these features must be embedded uh, in order to become vectors. And embedding operation is really just look up in the table by the item ID to return a vector, and these embedding tables get learned. So if we look at a quick example, let's say in this case we have one, two, three, four, five features or five attributes. So the first one is the username, and username really will get converted into an ID so you can use it for lookup in a table, right? So let's say in this case user ID is one, so we go to the first row of the lookup table for users. Then we have location, so let's say Cupertino, and let's say that happens to have ID two. Then you go to row two of the location embedding table and so forth. And then you can have user device, uh, movie ID that you're considering for recommending and so forth. But essentially what happens for each of those IDs, you don't use those numbers directly to do math operations in the neural network. You use them to index into these embedding tables or lookup tables where you grab a vector and then you collect those vectors and together you pass those onto the neural network to operate on. 
Uh, and all of these tables, whatever is shown in green here, they are learned through training, right? So initially, uh, you know, they are randomly initialized, and through training, they're given meaningful values um, to the application or to the neural network that they um, are followed by. Um, a slight extension of these lookup tables are multi-hot features, where they typically get used for a history of items. So maybe you have, you know, past history of the movies that you have watched or that you have commented on. Uh, and the general operation now is that you have n IDs or n items that you will look at, but the output of the embedding operation is going to be a single vector. So in this case, we have, I guess, a sequence of six movies. All of them get looked up into the embedding table, and for them we get a set of their embedding vectors individually. So for each movie, we get an embedding vector, right? So let's say for, I don't know, for Teletubbies, we get the top vector over here. But then to produce an output representing the history of having watched these movies, we'll do some kind of pointwise combination of these vectors or reduction, right? So let's say we just compute the average, and that produces the orange vector as an output. So now you're doing n vector reads for one vector output, and that sometimes is called n hot. That's just the ratio of reads to write that you produce. Um, so some characteristics of the uh, embeddings for recommenders, um, and because we'll see embeddings come up later on for language networks, and they're actually quite a bit different. So the number of reads per write of this hotness varies uh, quite widely. Uh, there will be many attributes that are one hot, so you'll do one read and just one write. Um, there are other features where you'll have hundreds of reads per one write. So if you have longer histories for user uh, preferences or behavior while browsing or viewing items. And these will be memory bandwidth limited operations. Again, you're doing very few math operations per vector read, right? Because you really do some address computation, go to the embedding table, grab a vector, and copy it elsewhere. You might add it actually with the running sum, but that's you know, maybe one addition per four or two bytes read from memory. So low arithmetic intensity for these operations. Sizes of the embeddings also vary pretty widely uh, in practice. You know, there are embeddings as small as, you know, hundreds of megabytes in size, uh, and there are embedding uh, or recommended neural networks that use embeddings in uh, tens of terabytes in size, or around 10 terabytes in size. And actually a good reference for that is a Hotchips tutorial uh, from last year, from the scale-out tutorial, where uh, we had a talk about a 10 terabyte uh, recommendation system and how it was trained on, uh, on a multi-node system. Now, the number of tables, again, vary somewhere between tens and hundreds, so that's the number of different attributes, because you get a table per attribute. Uh, table sizes, so while they do add up somewhere between 100 megabytes and tens of terabytes, uh, also, you know, will vary. So you'll have from tens to billions of rows. The smaller tables might be something, let's say, like weekday. If, uh, as part of the sort of interaction, you take th the time and, let's say, day of the week when the interaction is happening. Well, there are only seven days in a week, so there'll be only seven rows in that embedding table. Um, larger tables, let's say, that represent items that you could find, let's say, on Amazon or um, uh, any other uh, shopping service, that can actually now extend to billions of different items, and each one would have an embedding vector. Uh, columns per table, so the size of the vector that you're grabbing from these tables, again, varies from 10 elements to hundreds of elements. So that's how you end up with sort of pretty wide ranges of um, embedding sizes. And pretty much all the parameters really go to the embeddings in these networks. Uh, so large sizes of embeddings actually pose interesting challenges uh, to chips. So on one side, since you have you know, many such tables to look up to or, or to make lookups from, and uh, for multi-hot tables, you also may, may, do, may be doing multiple lookups. And as we saw in the previous figures, uh, your lookups are sort of scattered, right? So they're not nicely uh, spread through the table. So let's say if you look at the history of, let's say, six movies here, the lookup, uh, the vectors that you're looking at, they're not consecutive in memory for those six movies. They'll be spread out uh, all over the memory because they're user behavior based. So you require quite a bit of address translation bandwidth or address translation throughput on your hardware uh, because you'll be firing off a lot of addresses that are not necessarily in close proximity to each other. Another obvious challenge is that, you know, embeddings can get very large, you know, up to 10 terabytes. Um, these certainly exceed the accelerator memory, you know, whichever accelerators you look at today. Um, those typically have somewhere between tens, you know, close to 100 gigabytes of memory, right? It'll be high bandwidth memory, but it sort of approaches 100 gigabytes, right? So quite a bit smaller than, let's say, 10 terabyte uh, embeddings that are on the larger models. However, um, 
These can still be accommodated by accelerator systems because the data, when you look it up in these tables, it's not really uniformly distributed. So not all entries in those embedding tables are equally popular. So here we have a histogram of Criteria 1 terabyte uh, data set for one of its features, I believe it's feature 19. And the x-axis is just category IDs, so there are about 300 million uh, categories, so the embedding table could have up to about 300 million rows in it. And the y-axis is actually log scale, so it's log 10, and it's really the number of occurrences of each of those categories in the training data set. So we can see sort of very steep drop-off where a very small number of rows in that table are very popular and are responsible for most of the accesses, whereas there's this also long tail of much less frequently occurring uh, rows. So this lends itself pretty nicely to various uh, memory hierarchies where you have caches, you know, let's say on-chip memory, maybe DRAM, and then you could even use host uh, memory. And you know, some systems also even use secondary storage like SSDs for like really infrequently used entries. So the access pattern, you know, enables various uh, interesting architectural solutions to, to the problem. Okay, so that was all the embeddings for recommenders. Uh, if we look at the neural network itself, uh, so all the embedding vectors that we looked up, they sort of get combined, let's say concatenated, there are other approaches to combine them, and then they're fed into a neural network. And a neural network is going to be really a sequence of fully connected layers, sometimes called, you know, MLP. Um, and it's fully connected because we don't, you know, again, data is not structured, we don't know of any spa uh, spatial relationship. Therefore, we really just sort of allow an opportunity for each input element to interact with all the others. So if we look at an image here, so let's say incoming values are sort of yellow elements, outgoing values from a fully connected layer will be green, and the purple lines indicate sort of parameters of the model that will actually multiply the yellow value with some learned uh, weight and uh, accumulate that into the green output. So we see that each input element is collected, connected to each output element. And mathematically, this ends up being, you know, matrix vector multiply. So the purple connections, they really turn into white matrix here. Because the weight matrix, you know, if you look at it, you can sort of view it as projecting from eight dimensions in the input to four dimensions on the output, right? So that's how we have four by eight matrix to perform this projection. Um, the incoming values form a vector. So here we have as x, really a batch of two uh, vectors coming in, and after projection we produce two vectors in green, which form the vector Y. So MLPs end, end up being sort of a sequence of fully connected layers, which are in practice matrix, matrix multiplies. And then each fully connected layer typically is followed by a nonlinearity, uh, actually always followed by that, so rarely use sigmoid, something like that, which will be a pointwise op. And some of them will include normalization, like batch normalization or others. And if we look at sort of sizes that occur in practice, so these MLPs traditionally, not always, but much of the time, sort of form these tower-like architectures where you start sort of wider at the beginning, as then you approach sort of, as you go deeper and deeper closer to the output, your layers sort of narrow and make the width of the data narrower and narrower, right? So here we can see, you know, input is pretty wide, and then after the first fully connected layers, maybe half the width, after the second fully connected layers, half the width again, and so forth, and eventually turns into a scalar uh, for each batch instance. So the depths for these neural networks vary somewhere between three and 10 layers in range. You know, th there are exceptions, um, but those are sort of pretty frequent if you look at the literature. Um, some, you know, smaller configuration uh, from the literature might be, you know, you start with a 256 element width, then you have project down to 128 and project to 64, and then you either produce a vector or a scalar after that. And some of the larger models in, a, in the public domain are starting maybe, let's say, with 2K element width and then progressively make the data narrower, let's say, down to 256. I think this was based on a paper from YouTube maybe, by now probably around maybe five years ago. So that's effectively the characteristics of recommenders, right? You have large embeddings, and then you have a sequence of sort of small to medium size, fully connected layers that are matrix multiplies. So they combine sort of math limited layers with um, memory limited layers. Um, they have challenges in both parts uh, of the world, I suppose. Okay, so continuing on, on now to grid-based data. So recommenders or sort of unstructured data usually results in kind of embeddings followed by fully connected layers because we use fully connected layers since we don't know a priori about any relationships between uh, various attributes that are coming into the neural network. Now, 2D uh, grid data examples include things like images. Um, 
No, so we'll look at some 2D image examples, which can really be thought of as you know, 3D tensors that have height, width, and some number of channels. Right, so and we'll sort of continue this sort of uh, notion throughout the presentation of data is really a collection of vectors. So a 3D image, let's say, you know, typical input image will have height, width, and will have three channels, one for red, for green, and for blue. Uh, but it can also be sort of thought of as a 2D matrix of vectors, where you have height and width, and then each element after that is a vector. So in the RGB image case, it's an L a vector of three elements. And then the channel counts increase as you go through the neural network. But this is sort of a useful way to think about it, because oftentimes uh, convolutional networks will talk about 2D convolutions, but the third dimension is implied because it's really a 2D collection of vectors. So networks that, you, that get used in practice are convolutional neural networks, so CNNs, which will be some sequence of convolutional layers, normalizations, pointwise operations, and so forth. Uh, transformers are being experimented on nowadays, so sort of attention-based networks. Um, we'll touch very, very briefly on those and more sort of on the uh, language side. And then the outputs actually also vary quite widely. Uh, sometimes output will be a vector, let's say a vector of probabilities if you're doing image classification or preparing vectors for image search for similarity. Um, they can be multiple vectors, so things like bounding box coordinates uh, for objects in the image. Bounding boxes can be 2D or 3D, so immediately you get you know, sets of vectors that you're producing out of the neural network. Um, it could also be other 2D images. You could be transferring the image style or computing instance segmentation, for example. All of those really have per pixel data. Um, you know, image denoising, upscaling, all of them produce images of their own at the end. Okay, so convolution layer, right? So that's fundamentally the biggest difference from MLPs. Uh, and it's based on a key observation that unlike for unstructured data, where there were no known spatial relationships, here data is on a regular grid. Uh, therefore, there is a spatial relationship between different input elements. So, you know, if you think about an image, pixels that are close in proximity, they're usually related, right? So a set of pixels in a neighborhood will make up a person's face or a car and so forth. So convolution actually takes advantage of this observation. Rather than to produce an output element, rather than looking at all the input pixels, it only looks at a small input neighborhood. So let's say seven by seven pixels, five by five, three by three. So convolution operates sort of on much uh, sort of narrower slice of input. So it will, if we look here, to produce the single red output uh, in this output image or, or output plane, we will look at a three by three neighborhood in the corresponding area in the input, right? Whereas a fully connected layer actually would have looked at all the pixels that we have here in, in gray. So you're dramatically reducing the amount of computation. And you can do that because of the inherent structure in the input data. Uh, and then by stacking a sequence of these convolutions, you sort of keep expanding how much of the original input is influencing a particular pixel, right? So here, a single pixel was influenced by a neighborhood of three by three inputs. But if I took three, uh, if I take in two of these convolutions, put them back to back, now the output pixel after two convolutions would be influenced by a neighborhood of five by five pixels. And then we'll see there are different variants of convolutions that expand that even further. So after a sequence of convolutional layers, you can actually have output elements that see all of the input image at the beginning or are influenced by it. So you get sort of a similar effect of viewing the entire uh, input uh, data tensor that you would get with fully connected layers, but it's a lot cheaper computationally. If we look at convolution uh, parameters, so there are four that define convolution. So KCRS has sort of one naming convention. So RS typically refer to the height and width of the filter. So in this case it would be, let's say, three by three. So both are three. Uh, C will be the number of input channels. So if it's the very first input layer that you're operating on, then it'll typically it'll be three channels for red, green, and blue. And then you have K filters where each one produces an output plane. So we have a quick illustration of this. So we have an input tensor, so batch size one in this particular case. So you have you know, height and width for the image and some number of channels C. And then you'll, if you have a single filter for convolution that operates on R by S sort of spatial neighborhood, but it actually will consider all the C channels for any location where that filter sort of slid through. But, and that's sort of pretty traditional filter application. You can sort of think that you take this convolution and you just slide it across the H and W dimension of that slice, and you produce a single slice or single channel of output here in purple, right? So I thought it was very clever. I took blue and red and made purple out of it. 
Uh, now, in, in practice, input tensor may actually have a fourth dimension, so it's a batch size. We don't operate on a single image at a time. You might operate on n images at a time. So then you turn into a four-dimensional tensor, so it has NHWC dimensions. Okay, so now that's what you would have gotten for a single filter. You get a single channel of output, but if you have k such filters, you'll produce an output that has k channels. And that's sort of the idea behind convolutional networks. When you start stacking these convolutions, you'll be generally creating more and more channels. Right, so typical convolutional networks today are really a sequence of stages. And the number of stages vary somewhere between, I don't know, three to five, let's say, where a stage is sort of a repeated set of uh, building blocks. And each block is usually a few convolutions. And they maintain sort of the spatial resolution in the x and y dimension. They might adjust the channel count. Um, so if we look, for example, here, we start at the beginning, let's say we feed an input image on the very left, and then after the first convolution, we have reduced the spatial dimension, say in half, in both the height and width, but we did increase the number of channels. And then we have a sequence of blocks that really keep the same height and width, and traditionally they'll output the same number of channels. And then again, you'll have a convolution or pooling layer that once again reduce the spatial dimension. Uh, and you'll see that progressively, the height and width is sort of cut down, so at the end, you might be producing just sort of a single uh, vector for, let's say, image classification networks. But typically, you will increase the number of channels as you progress through the neural network. So there are also a pretty large variety of convolutions. Right? We looked at the sort of simplest convolution, and we'll just look at, take a quick look at some sampling of various variants. Um, so I'll sort of split them into two variants, uh, spatial variants of convolutions and then channel variants. So here we have some spatial variants. Uh, so we'll start with a diluted convolution. The idea is very simple. So here is an example. We still look at a three by three filter, but rather than filter tabs being sort of three, you know, covering a three by three neighborhood that where all the tabs are adjacent, now they actually are sort of strided by one or dilated by one. Sometimes these are called a true convolutions in uh, in literature as well. So still we only have nine tabs. So three by three but they're sort of spaced out more widely from each other. So that's the dilution factor. And again, what this creates is that it sort of increases the receptive field. So the area in the input uh, that influences a particular output element for a convolution, but keeping the computation cost the same because you're still doing sort of nine taps, but you're seeing a larger neighborhood now. Uh, deformable convolution, so it may start as a three by three adjacent neighborhood, but then through the training process, a filter can learn the offsets from the original sort of configuration to whatever the application prefers. So in this case, we get sort of this weird shaped uh, filter, um, and that might suit some applications a little bit better. Right? This is obviously you know, more complex and more complex learning involved there. I also mentioned strided convolution. Uh, this is sort of more output related, where you apply these filters, but you apply them now at strides in order to reduce the spatial res resolution of the map. So as we saw in the sort of previous figure, when we reduce the spatial dimensions, oftentimes this will be done with a strided convolution, with strided pooling, which is very similar. But the idea here now, if we look at the output, uh, we have two adjacent output elements, let's say red and blue. Now to produce those, we don't look at immediately adjacent three by three neighborhoods in the input. We actually separate them by stride one. So input image is now larger here, but we can see to produce the red pixel, we look at the neighborhood centered on the darker red pixel. But then the neighborhood for the blue output element is not immediately to the, left, uh, to the right of it, it's one over. So the blue pixel is now strided, so it's at stride two from the red one. And that's why if you stride two, you'll typically reduce the spatial dimension by a factor of two in each dimension. If the stride were four, then you'd be reducing the output spatial dimension by a factor of four, and so forth. Um, there are also deconvolutions, or sort of transpose convolutions, which kind of do the opposite thing. They will take an input tensor of one resolution, it'll produce something that's maybe twice as large. Um, I don't have an illustration for that. Okay, so now some channel variants. Uh, so we've seen traditional convolution with its parameters and the number of multiply adds. So this is here, some, just a summary. We have uh, you know, slides for each. But the idea behind, let's say, depth-wise separable convolution or grouped convolutions is try to uh, do less math and have fewer parameters and try to achieve the same functionality uh, from the application's point of view. So if we look at depth-wise separable convolution, 
it's really a sequence of two convolutions. And it was introduced a few years ago in MobileNets. And it's pretty popular in smaller neural networks for smaller devices. Um, the idea here is that in the traditional convolution, each filter really had, was being applied over all C channels of the input. In depth-wise separable convolution, the first filter is really applying an RS filter per channel. Right, so it's not going over C channels, it's only applied per channel. So each channel gets its own filter, so you only have RS multiply adds per output element here, and you produce a single channel of output. Uh, but then this would be followed up, so if we look at the input, now it's a large input, it has C channels, therefore it's going to have C such filters uh, that are being learned. Uh, so these filters are much, much smaller now, they're much cheaper. If we back up really quick, if we look at these filters, Applying each filter here took C times R times S multiply adds. Whereas here, applying each filter is only R times S multiply adds. So you take the input tensor, per channel you apply each channel's own learned filter, and you produce an intermediate output tensor that's of the same dimensions. And then you follow that up with a one by one convolution over all the channels, and that sort of mixes up the data from the channels. Because the first convolution, uh, it really only was paying attention to the input elements in the same channel uh, as your output. And by applying a one by one, you actually get an opportunity to, to mix all the channels. So parameter count is smaller now. It goes from, I think for the original one, it would start out as uh, KCRS. That's reduced by roughly an order of magnitude, CRS plus CK for the two filters. And multiply as are also substantially reduced. Um, sort of a Maybe a generalization of that is group convolution, where conceptually what you're doing, you take your input tensor and you divide it into some number of groups, let's say G groups, in this case four groups. Right? So you just sort of partition the tensor into equally sized groups of channels. Then for each group, you have its own set of filters. Now these are spatial, but they're each over a smaller number of channels. So here over C over four channels. Uh, and you have K over four such filters for each group. Right? So while the total number of filters is the same, each one is actually working on much smaller input and much smaller output. Right? So each group has K over G filters, uh, and each filter is really C, you no know, channels divided by number of groups times RS. Um, and then each of these operations per group will produce a portion of the output. And then we can concatenate all the outputs together and produce the uh, output tensor. Usually this will also be followed up by one by one convolution, which, which will provide that mixing. But that's usually sort of not part of the group convolution itself, it's usually more part of the neural network. So again, we dramatically reduce the number of parameter count, usually by a factor of the group sizes or uh, group count. And same thing happens to the number of multiply adds that have to be performed. And if you're going to stare at this uh, a little bit, um, you can actually see that if you set the number of groups to, to be equal to the number of input channels C, then really you're getting the depth-wise separable convolution here. So you can sort of really sort of slide on the scale between depth-wise separable convolution, where groups, uh, group count is the number of channels, all the way to the traditional convolution, which is more math intensive um, and uh, has a single group. Okay, so general characteristics of CNNs, you know, layer types that are involved, you know, from math multiplayers, you have various convolutions, and you know there are convolutions that we didn't cover here today. Um, you do have reduction type layers that do normalizations, pooling, softmax operations. Um, you also have pointwise uh, operations, such as nonlinearities like ReLU, sigma one, and so forth. Pointwise adds for skip connections and so forth. Uh, parameter sizes uh, vary, so they're typically much smaller than. Um, recommended networks, so somewhere between tens to hundreds of megabytes in size for a neural network. Depth-wise, they'll be somewhere, you know, tens to hundreds of layers, so much deep, deeper than recommendation networks that we looked at briefly earlier. And the channel count in various tensors varies somewhere from hundreds to thousands for the larger networks. Um, input dimensions are also uh, varied, right, so small images might be, you know, thousands of pixels. Um, larger images might be 2 megapixels, right? So the image could be 2K by 1K pixels, uh, and that gets fed into the neural network. And again, arithmetic intensity will vary uh, widely, you know, even from layer to layer, even for a given network, based on the uh, parameters of the convolutions that were chosen. Uh, quick note on 3D grid data, all the concepts are exactly the same as for 2D grids, except now you just add an additional dimension to convolutions on all the other layers, and then, you know, theoretically everything remains the same. Uh, implementations get more challenging, but all the ideas, all the same ideas still apply. 
Okay, so going on to sequence data, um, I'll try to speed up as we're beginning begin to roll, uh, run low on time. So sequence data is really a sequence of tokens. Uh, and again, each token will, will get turned into a vector. Uh, and we'll see how that's done in a moment. It's done through embedding layers, unsurprisingly. Um, two types of networks in general. So you have recurrent networks, LSTMs, GRUs, and so forth. Uh, we won't touch on those today due to time constraints. And we also have transformer networks that are intention-based, and those are pretty popular nowadays. And outputs that are typical are either sequences of vectors, again, for things like uh, language translation. Uh, it could be a vector of probabilities if we're trying to predict the next word or for things like chatbots and so forth. Okay, so the input data, as I mentioned, is a sequence of tokens, uh, which will be words or word pieces, let's say, for languages. And again, each word or word piece might get an integer ID, but it doesn't have an inherent meaning to the application, so it must be embedded. But Embeddings are much smaller than for recommenders. Uh, they'll always be one hot, you do one read per, per write, uh, and they'll typically be one table, maybe two tables if you're doing translation between two languages. Um, table sizes are much smaller, so vocabulary sizes maybe go up to 50,000 rows, um, compared to billions for recommenders potentially, and embedding vector sizes are actually bigger, so they're somewhere between 100 and you know, thousands of elements, uh, again, compared to recommenders that are you know, 10 to 100 elements. Um, quick note on vision transformers, usually those don't have any embedding. They'll take some intermediate output from a convolutional network and sort of divide it up into tiles, and then out of each tile they'll create a vector and now feed that as a sequence to a transformer net. Uh, simplified view of dot attention. I think probably I will skip this because there's a lot of text, but the idea is that you really are trying to determine how much attention each element should pay to all the other ones. And really you do that by Let's say if you get a sequence of four tokens, you get four vectors, and you'll compute, let's see, all 16 pairs uh, dot products. And a dot product of one element's vector with another element's vector produces a value that sort of indicates how much attention you should be paying to them. You know, that has some magnitude to it. It'll get normalized to do softmax, but eventually what really that turns into is into a bunch of matrix matrix multiplies to produce these sort of query key and value vectors. Uh, matrix matrix multiply and, and batch matrix matrix multiply to compute the dot products. Um, softmax to sort of convert all of those magnitudes into you know range that or values that add up to one. And then another matrix multiply to do a weight at some of your neighborhood. So the idea is that if you're looking at a single vector, it determines how much attention to pay to all the other vectors in the sequence. And based on that, it does a weighted sum of all those other vectors with itself, and that's how it gets sort of new representation. So that's a gross oversimplification of what attention does, but you, you can see how you get a bunch of matrix operations out of that. Um, so a quick view of transformer at a high level. It's a basic building block. Um, so QKV, that's some matrix. So everything that's in green is a matrix multiply, and dark green implies that those matrix multiplies involve learned parameters that are learned through training, and light green are batch matrix multiplies that only involve activation tensors. Those are connected to attention mechanism. And then usually, you know, you'll have projection, a couple more fully connected layers, and in gray you have various reductions, so softmax involves reductions, uh, as well as layer norm, and then things like dropout and GALU are completely pointwise operations. So quite a few matrix operations, some reduction operations, some pointwise operations here. So looking at the characteristics, layer types involved in these networks are matmols. So you have matrix multiplies, batch matrix multiplies, and these do get large for the larger language models. Uh, reductions for normalizations, pointwise operations to add skip connections and so forth. And then you have embeddings, which are typically quite a bit smaller than uh, for recommenders. Uh, parameter size-wise, you'll have somewhere between tens to hundreds of these transformer blocks, right? So that's just a single block, and you'll create a network by adding up in sequence, you know, tens to hundreds of these blocks, each with its own operations and learned weights. Um, hidden size, so the dimensionality of the vector that you look up in a table and feed into these blocks for each item in a sequence, again, varies somewhere between, um, you know, hundreds to thousands of elements. For the largest models, it goes up to close to, you know, 20,000. And model sizes go somewhere anywhere between 100 megabytes to models that are approaching now a terabyte in sizes. So the larger models like, you know, GPT-3 and Megatron are getting to those sizes. Uh, sequence lengths, hundreds to thousands of tokens. Batch sizes can also get large for training on large systems. And arithmetic intensity generally is pretty high due to the number of matrix operations that are involved. I think I had some slides on graph data, but since I'm out of time, I'll skip that. But 
you know, graph neural networks, or at least graph convolutional networks, are sort of similar operation-wise to all the networks we've seen before, except that they now do have sparse matrix multiplies with dense matrices, right? So we haven't seen those operations before. Graph neural networks sort of introduced those. Um, and graph neural networks oftentimes spend a lot of time in data preparation because graphs are very large, so you, they usually train on subsamples of the graph, and to generate those subsamples can take as long as to run forward and backward prop uh, through the network itself on each mini batch. So with that, I guess, you know, super quick summary, you know, as we've seen, neural network types that are used oftentimes depend on the nature of the input data, right? So you can have unstructured data, which will usually go to MLP structure of neural networks. Regular grid data will use some form of convolutional nets. Sequence data will use attention mechanisms and, and transformers or RNNs for recurrent networks. Uh, and graph data will use something like graph convolutional nets. Operation types, you know, there are dot product based operations, map models, you know, reductions, pointwise, and lookup tables. Uh, you know, they stress different pieces of the hardware. Skip connections are worth mentioning because they are popular in both transformers and CNNs nowadays. They do increase memory footprint uh, for both training and inference, since data has to be kept uh, around when passing through skip connections. And another sort of notable observation is that. Researchers keep inventing new and new operation types, right? So there's always new challenges for, for hardware. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Thank you, Paulis. Uh, that was a great introduction. I think we probably still can handle a couple of questions. Um, for the rest of the audience, one of our talks later in the day uh, will be pre-recorded, and uh, the speaker will be able to take questions through Slack only. So we may shift by five minutes the whole schedule. Uh, I have two questions for you, Paul, is from the Slack. Uh, the first one is uh, from Saptadeep Paul. He is a PhD uh, candidate in UCLA. His question is, uh, can you provide some insights into how of the embedding lookup performance gets bottlenecked by main memory bandwidth versus addresses translation overhead in the TLBs? Or does it often get bottlenecked by interconnect bandwidth in a multi-CPU GPU setup because of the lack of locality? That, that's a very good question, and the, the answer is actually very complex and will take a long time, but it, it really sort of depends on your system, right? So. Uh, Depending on how much address translation bandwidth your system has, you know, address translation could become a bottleneck because you know, translating from virtual to physical addresses, you have to go through TLB hierarchies, and at some point, if you have a lot of misses in your translation caches, you can get bottlenecked by the throughput of the translation itself. Now, if you get a lot of hits in TLBs, you know, translation rate is high, then you're more likely to be bottlenecked by memory bandwidth. Um, but even for memory bandwidth, you know, DRAMs nowadays are pretty sort of complex and parallel systems. There also has to be sort of a lot of DRAM channels uh, and banks that can get activated and deactivated in parallel. Um, so even if you have enough of those accesses, if your memory system is not set up to handle sort of a, a high throughput of addresses that are really scattered in various locations in memory, you could get actually bottlenecked by DRAM uh, activations and deactivations and not really saturate the bandwidth. Um, so yeah, so Im embeddings are sort of a very simple uh, operation to understand conceptually. It sounds very simple. You get an index, you go look up the row at that index, and you move it somewhere else in memory. But because of the address patterns, um, it can get surprisingly challenging to systems. Thank you. And uh, we have one more question. Hopefully you can answer that too. So uh, from uh, Hi I Nem, uh, she is a member of Advanced Technology Group at uh, NERSC, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She's asking when using depth-wise separable or grouped convolutions to reduce the number of parameters. Is there a trade-off with the accuracy convergence or some other things? Uh, that, that's a good question. So th the short answer is yes, but it also depends. Uh, so people have had, it, oftentimes it depends on the size of the data set. So what has been seen is that going from, let's say, on a data set like ImageNet, which is moderately sized, it only has about 1.2 million images, um, you can only achieve a certain amount of accuracy because of the data set limitations itself. So there, at some point, you reach a saturation point uh, with how many parameters you need to have in your neural network. And then by innovating on the structure of the convolution, you can reduce the number of parameters in math operation and largely maintain the accuracy. But what has been shown by some papers you know, from Facebook and Google, uh, when they make the networks much larger to operate on much, much larger data sets, then again, 
at least some work indicates that going with convolutions that are sort of more math intensive or have more parameters, so maybe have fewer groups but each group is larger, um, can lead to higher accuracy in the results. So it really sort of depends on our data set and the size of the neural network. Thank you, Paulus, uh, for a great intro to the day. Um, that thanks Paulus virtually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And uh, with that, uh, we conclude the first talk and uh, switch to the second talk in this tutorial, uh, which will be given by Peter Madsen uh, from Google and ML Commons. Uh, Peter is a software engineer at Google. Uh, he co-founded and is president of ML Commons and co-founded and was general chair of the ML Perf Consortium that preceded it. Previously, Peter founded the Programming Systems and Applications Group at NVIDIA Research and was Vice President of Software Infrastructure for Stream Processes, Processors. And also, he was a Managing Engineer at Reservoir Labs. His research focuses on understanding machine learning models and data through quantitative metrics and analysis. Peter holds a PhD and Master of Science from Stanford University and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Washington. Uh, Peter will be talking about MLPerf, uh, which become essentially an industry standard to measure performance of different systems uh, for deep learning applications. Uh, his talk is pre-recorded. Unfortunately, he won't be able to take the questions live, uh, but we will be handling questions about training parts of the tutorial live. Uh, Paulus, actually, who is also uh, have very good connections with MLPerf and part of the consortium, will be answering those. And uh, questions related to inference will be answered in Slack by David. And with that, I'm passing to Peter to tell us about MLPerf. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a tutorial on MLPerf training and inference benchmarks. I'm Peter Matson. I work at Google. I'm also the president of ML Commons Association, which is the nonprofit that operates uh, MLPerf. Let's dive right in. First of all, it's important to realize that I'm presenting this, but MLPerf is the work of many, many people. Uh, these are the author lists from the main training and inference papers, and many more folks have contributed since then, uh, in particular, uh, producing great submissions to the benchmarks. Let's start with one basic question. Why should we benchmark ML? Why should we care? And I think this is best addressed by a slide that I presented at Hot Chips two years ago. Why benchmark machine learning? First of all, machine learning is going to be very big. The hardware market uh, will be a multi-multi-billion dollar industry uh, in very short order. And as Peter Drucker famously said, what gets measured gets improved. Benchmarking has this almost magical property in that it aligns research with development, engineering with marketing, and competitors across the industry in pursuit of a clearer objective. Together, through benchmarking, we can use constructive competition to make hardware and software more efficient for this extremely fast growing uh, industry. So, does benchmarking like MLPerf uh, work? Does it do this thing that uh, we think it can? Well, here's uh, some data to support that. Uh, this shows MLPerf training results. This is the best result on several MLPerf benchmarks, uh, outpacing Moore's law over the uh, last three years. And some of this is, you know, hardware is getting faster. Um, it's driving people to optimize their software. People are getting better at building benchmarks. Um, people are particularly getting better at scaling benchmarks uh, or scaling ML, enabling them to, uh, to build bigger systems. Uh, but all of this is, is uh, advancement and learning uh, that is moving the field forward. And I think uh, you know, benchmarking is uh, an amazing catalyst uh, for this kind of progress. So how does it work? I'm going to talk about uh, two different kinds of benchmarking today. Today, I'm going to talk about first MLPerf training and then MLPerf inference. Start with MLPerf training. MLPerf training defines a benchmark as uh, taking a uh, data set, training a model on that data set until you achieve uh, a certain target quality. Uh, for the results of the model. One of the key questions here is which model? 
we have two different divisions in MLPerf. We have the open division, or sorry, the closed division, where we specify the model. For instance, we say, uh, you must use ResNet uh, v1.5. And the reason we have the closed division is this enables direct comparisons of hardware and software, apples to apples. We also have the open division where you can use any model. If you design a new kind of hardware that requires a new kind of model, but is way more efficient, we want to know about it and we want to showcase that. Uh, so this is what the open division is for. You can use any model. We want to use this division to drive innovation. The metric of MLPerf training is time to train. This is the time uh, to take a model from scratch to uh, fully trained. The alternative is throughput. That's how fast you can pump data through the model. Throughput has some um, seemingly nice characteristics and then it's really easy and cheap to measure. You, you don't need to run for very long. Um, but the challenge is that there's a lot of different ways to increase throughput, but still in effect make the model uh, take longer to train. So even though your throughput number goes up, uh, the actual in value to the user is worse. For instance, using very low precision, very high batch sizes, all of these things increase throughput, but they come at a cost in terms of the number of epochs, the number of passes through the data we need to make. So for this reason, we think time to train is the best. Um, it really is time to solution for the user. It has some drawbacks. It is computationally expensive to measure. Um, it does have a uh, high variance, but we think it is the least bad choice for measuring training systems. You have to be pretty precise in how you define it. Time to train includes excludes system initialization. Uh, this uh, really depends on a bunch of complex system state variables that are um, highly variable. Um, we also exclude uh, model initialization. The reason for this is that we are often benchmarking large systems on smaller models than those systems are really designed for because small models make retractable benchmarks. Um, but what this does mean is that the systems train the models very, very quickly. And so initialization, that wouldn't matter on a model of appropriate size for the system, uh, would be disproportionate if we uh, put it on the clock. Um, we also include data reformatting because we don't want to give um, advantages to systems that happen to match some sort of uh, native data format for the benchmark. Uh, so. That's, that's our metric, time to train with all those caveats. Uh, what do we measure it for? We measure it for an assortment of training workloads that we feel are fairly representative of what the uh, training uh, market and research field is doing. Uh, a lot of vision um, for everything from classification to segmentation to, in particular, medical segmentation. Um, things around speech and language, for instance, speech to text or NLP, um, commerce applications, uh, in particular, recommendation is huge. Um, and uh, research, cutting edge things um, like reinforcement learning, where we know there's going to be some amazing applications, but those applications uh, aren't as common today. Let's move to the next MLPerf benchmark, MLPerf inference. MLPerf inference defines a benchmark as taking inputs, passing them through a model that has already been trained, and measuring the quality of that model's outputs, uh, making sure they are at or above some sort of defined uh, level. So essentially just pumping data through a trained model, uh, how fast can you do that? Um, like MLPerf training, MLPerf inference has uh, two divisions, a closed division, where the model is specified for direct comparisons, and an open division, which allows any model to encourage innovation. Inference is a little more nuanced than training. In training, you just want to get the model uh, to uh, know what it needs to know. Uh, in inference, you can use the model in different ways. For instance, say you've got a cell phone and you're doing some sort of augmented vision application. You're just passing a stream of images, a single stream of images through the model. Or you might have multiple cameras on a, um, a self-driving car and you need to uh, handle multiple streams of data. Or you're operating a, um, a web application um, and you have a server that's handling incoming requests to perform uh, machine learning. 
Lastly, you might just have a pile of data. Um, say you've got a bunch of photos and you want to find all the photos of your cat. Um, and you want to do that as quickly as possible. So we have these four scenarios, single stream, multi-stream, server, and offline. We use a different metric for each scenario. For single stream, we use latency, because what you really care about is how fast can you process each of those data points. For multi-stream, we use number of streams. So we set a required uh, processing rate for each stream, and then we ask how many streams can you support. Uh, essentially, you know, for a self-driving car, this would be how many cameras could that car, uh, car handle. For server, we look at QPS. Um, so we use uh, some sort of Poisson simulated um, arrival um, of requests, and we see um, how fast can you service those requests uh, subject to some sort of latency bound. So they have to be at least this fast, every request. Um, can you service uh, lots of them? And lastly, there is offline, which is just a straightforward throughput measurement. So these four different scenarios reflect four substantially different use cases of a trained model for inference. MLPerf inference uh, in its latest version contains the following workloads for data center and edge systems. So these are fairly large systems. Um, this includes a mix of uh, vision systems, um, the same mix that I talked about for uh, training, again, speech and language, uh, Recommendation models, that these only make real sense in the data center, not at the edge. We also have a special MLPerf mobile inference benchmark that measures um, a range of vision capabilities um, and some basic uh, language uh, modeling. And we plan to uh, add speech to this in the near future. For data center and edge, in the data center, we really care about the offline and server scenarios. Again, that sort of batch processing of data or serving incoming requests, right? That's what you do in a data center. For edge, we might have single stream or offline or multi-stream scenarios, but we really don't have a server scenario. For mobile, we measure the single stream and offline scenarios. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's talk about what makes uh, ML benchmarking uh, hard, harder than many uh, benchmarking uh, tasks that have come before, and the contributions that we've made with MLPerf uh, to overcome those challenges. So for MLPerf training, the first and I think one of the biggest challenges is that ML uses a really diverse range of software stacks and hardware systems, and the two are often coupled. This means that People doing benchmarking can't use the same executable. Indeed, they often can't use the same code. So this makes benchmarking a lot harder. You can't just say, here's the benchmark, run it. It's going to print some numbers, use those. These systems exist at very different scales. You might be curious as to how the machine under your desk can do, or a giant pod of supercomputing resources. Um, and the scale of the system requires changes in how you train your model. You want to use different size batches. You probably want to use different size or different hyperparameters as a result of using different batches. Uh, the process of finding those hyperparameters requires doing a bunch of very computationally expensive experiments. Uh, you know, this could be unfair for people who don't have that much of a compute budget. How do we handle this? Uh, and lastly, and annoyingly, convergence is stochastic. Um, you have to make a different number of passes through the data uh, to train your model, depending on uh, various random variables, uh, random weights that you started with, non-deterministic floating point effects. Um, it's not predictable. And, and this is challenging. Uh, just substantiating that last point, here's a fairly well-behaved model. This is, this is ResNet um, for a variety of random seeds. Um, and you can see that because of the way the REST network learning rate works, um, it, it trains in a fairly predictable number of epochs. So this is good. But there's also things like Minigo. Here you can see um, that even for um, the same seed over a variety of experiments, the number of epochs required is highly unpredictable. Uh, so how do you handle this? All right, so those are our three big challenges, different software uh, and hardware systems, different scales, and uh, convergence being stochastic. 
So to handle the software and hardware systems uh, diversity, um, we came up with the idea of reference implementations and re-implementations. So we provide a reference implementation of the benchmark, but we allow submitters to re-implement um, that reference implementation in a way that makes sense for the system they're planning to test. Um, and we have a variety of rules about how they can do that. Um, it must be basically mathematically equivalent uh, to the reference implementation in terms of the work it does. So it's doing the same work, at least for the closed division. Uh, and then we have a peer review process where we can all inspect each other's code and determine that this is true. To handle uh, the different scales um, and the required tuning, um, we wanted to allow just the right amount of tunability so that people can get a fair measure of their system um, without uh, giving a huge reward to people who can just throw compute at finding the right hyperparameters. So we have a limited set of tunable hyperparameters and those hyperparameters have a limited range of values. So essentially this is about giving the right degree of flexibility. Lastly, uh, because convergence is stochastic, uh, we essentially use uh, multiple uh, samples. Um, we require multiple runs um, of the benchmarks by the submitters. And then we drop the low and the high values and average. We call this Olympic scoring. Um, and this manages to suppress a lot of the variance and give you a, a fairly consistent answer. Let's talk about the challenges and contributions of MLPerf inference. Um, MLPerf inference uh, has even more diverse software stacks and hardware systems. You know, everything from uh, cell phones uh, up to data center systems. So same problem as training, except it's even worse. Um, they also use different approaches to quantization. So on a smaller system, it may make sense to give up a little bit of accuracy um, by using uh, lower uh, floating point precision, for instance, or even uh, you know, small integers um, to get your model to run with less compute. Lastly, uh, inference is infinitely parallel. Um, this makes interpreting scores challenging um, because there are uh, infinitely scalable systems. So, you know, if you want a higher score, you just use two chips instead of one. Um, so you need to do some sort of normalization for meaningful comparison. This could be based on chips, list price, TCO, TDP, um, power, um, you know, a variety of different things. Um, and this will depend upon your application. So how did we handle these things? Um, Again, we approach the diversity of systems problem uh, with reference implementations and rules for re-implementation. Um, we have some additional constraints that are helpful here. Um, for instance, we provide the pre-trained -pre weights. This is the set of weights. You can um, use different software stacks to interpret them, but you have to use the same set of weights. And we also provide a standard load generator. So it provides the inputs uh, to your trained uh, model times the processing of those inputs and validates the outputs. So together, these constraints um, help a really wide range of systems under test um, make sure that they're doing the same thing. So given the different approaches for quantization, um, we have uh, sort of similar to the hyperparameter training rules. We allow some, but not too much. So what does that mean? Rules for limited quantization. Can you quantize? Yes, <clears throat> but you must do so in a principled mathematical manner. And you must be able to describe it so that anyone else can do the same thing. You have to say, this is what I did. Um, you can run the same thing on uh, the model and you can use that. You can also do a little bit of calibration using a small calibration set of data, but you can't retain, retrain the model for your chosen precision. And we feel like this is Roughly the right level um, of flexibility, especially for the closed division, you can always submit something more aggressive into the open division, but then it's, it's not really an apples to apples comparison anymore. Lastly, the infinite parallel problem, um, rather than normalize uh, officially, uh, we leave this to the user. So I, I'm not really saying that we have a solution here, but I do want to call attention to this for those looking at MLPerf inference results. Um, be aware that this is an infinitely parallel problem. Um, do some sort of normalization of the system um, to understand um, 
what the performance scores mean. All right, so that's how the benchmarks work. Let's talk a little bit about the submission process in case you were interested in submitting to MLPerf. So MLPerf's submission process can be roughly divided into two parts. One is the pre-submission process, where all the submitters are producing um, the uh, code that they intend to submit uh, and the results that they intend to submit. The other is the post-submission process, where we try and validate each other's submissions to make sure that all the rules are being followed. So, for pre-submission, a good place to start is with the reference implementations and the rules. Uh, down on the reference implementations, you can look through the code, see how the benchmarks could be implemented. Um, you can read the rules that tell you how you can re-implement those reference implementations, and you should join the submitters working group. There are active working groups for all the MLPerf benchmarks. Um, it's a great place to ask questions. Um, it's a great place to you know, bring up any problems with the rules where you think you know it's not fair to your system. A uh, very welcoming committee, uh, a welcoming community, um, and uh, you know, very flexible approach uh, to trying to make this work for everybody. Then you re-implement the benchmark for your system under test. For training, you have to tune the hyperparameters for whatever batch size you want to use. Um, generally, whatever you're doing, you're going to want to do some, some tuning, but this is worth calling out um, because uh, hyperparameters have such a profound effect on machine learning uh, behavior. You want to make sure you spend some time tuning them and that you pay attention to the rules for what you can tune. Then you run the benchmark the required number of times. So if the benchmark is stochastic, as in training, some of the inference benchmarks, uh, you have to run it multiple times. When you submit, you submit the logs from all your runs, um, some of your code, uh, and that's specified in the rules what code you need to submit, um, and some metadata. And you submit this um, into GitHub uh, before the submission deadline. Then, once everybody's submitted, the results are not immediately published. Instead, there is a post-submission process where all submitters uh, have a chance to look at all other submissions and to raise issues like, I don't think this person followed the rules correctly. Here's why. And then a, um, a small group of all the submitters will meet and talk about those, uh, those issues and figure out what the resolution is. <coughs> For training, we also allow hyperparameter borrowing. We don't want to advantage someone just because they happen to find the world's greatest hyperparameter set. So if you see that someone else has a set of hyperparameters and you would like to use it, you can adopt it and without making other code changes, um, update your results uh, using the new hyperparameters. Once this peer review process is done, MLPerf posts all results. Uh, we make all logs, metadata, and the code that was submitted uh, public under Apache 2. So I think this is really um, a great resource, even for people who are not submitting. If you want to go see a bunch of different high-performance implementations um, of machine learning uh, tasks, uh, you should check out the MLPerf submissions. Um, it's getting better every round. It really is, um, I think, a great uh, learning and even uh, development resource. If you make it through this complicated process, um, you've really contributed something great to the field, shown what your hardware or software can do, uh, you should celebrate. Uh, here you can see from the very first benchmarking round, this is a team um, uh, taking their submission down literally to the last, uh, last uh, second. Uh, you can see the countdown uh, clock up on the big boards. Uh, and having a classically wild uh, Silicon Valley party afterwards, uh, you know, just like uh, depicted in the uh, in the social network, you know, just people going crazy. Um, you know, but they deserve it. They uh, they successfully submitted to Uh Here is a more detailed uh, version of the timeline I just covered at an abstract level. Um, this is the one for inference 1.1, which is coming up. It runs about 12 weeks um, from finally um, uh, freezing the benchmark list um, to submitting results. The key thing is not to try and grasp this complexity, but know it is complex. This is a fairly complex benchmark. Uh, make sure you attend the weekly submitter meetings. Um, they will help you through all of it. Um, and at the end of it, you'll have a very uh, technically rigorous result. 
MLperf uh, is not standing still. Uh, we continue to work to uh, refine and improve and expand the benchmarks. Um, we also uh, bring more people into the uh, MLPerf benchmarking process, um, growing number of submitters each round. Uh, training 1.0, the last round of training had 13 submitting orgs. Inference 1.0, the most recent round of inference had 17 submitting orgs. Um, we keep improving the benchmarking technology. For instance, in MLPerf training, we developed the idea of reference convergence points. That's essentially taking the reference implementation and measuring how it converges and making sure that submissions converge the same way. We're also introducing new benchmarks. Uh, we introduced a benchmark for 3D medical imaging, 3D UNET, uh, and a species text benchmark, RMT, um, and we continue to, to add new benchmarks and replace existing ones to track the very fast moving ML field. One good question is, how do we decide uh, what benchmarks uh, we should add? Um, and the way that we're trying to do this going forward is with advisory boards. Um, advisory boards are a group of, groups of experts that we bring together to tell us uh, what benchmark we should have in a particular area. We want to make sure that the benchmarks are defined by um, practitioners, um, that they reflect real use cases, and that they avoid submitter bias. We don't want uh, to be grading our own test. Uh, we want real users to say, this is what you should be benchmark, bar benchmarking, and then hardware and software developers to be competing to do the best on that benchmark. Let's take a quick look at some of the advisory boards. Our first couple of advisory boards were in recommendation medical imaging, um, leading to the DLRM and 3D unit benchmarks. Later, um, uh, advisory boards um, that are currently in operation are looking at automotive, um, general purpose vision, um, and NLP and speech. How can you get involved? Um, if you'd like to submit, if you'd like to improve the benchmarking process, if you'd like to help with an advisory board, um, please reach out, um, mocommons.org, uh, get involved. Um, we would love to have you. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have um, a lot of really great, um, both very smart and very friendly people uh, join our community. And we're always looking uh, for more folks um, who want to have a big impact on the field. Thank you, everyone. And with that, um, I will move to questions. Thank you, Peter, for a great talk. Um, we have several questions on the Slack. Uh, some of them have been already answered. Uh, there is one question which I will ask uh, Paulus to answer live, as it hasn't been answered on Slack. So the question is uh, from Hi INM on uh, again from NERSC. Uh, she is asking uh, when stating data reformatting is excluded from time to train. Does it also include the time to read data, stage data, preprocessing? Uh, or what's the line in the sand for what is covered in data reformatting? Sure, that, that's an excellent question. Um, so th there are sort of two aspects of data, sort of data reformatting and then any kind of data processing that happens live during the training sessions. So in MLPerf, you are allowed to reprocess the data, not fundamentally changing or not adding or subtracting content. Uh, with the thinking that that's what would happen in practice. You take your data set, you create some database out of it, and then that database, after it's been prepared, is reused for many different training sessions, whether you're training different neural networks, different optimizer parameters, and so forth. So that's why we don't uh, sort of time uh, reformatting, because in practice that gets amortized over many, many, many different uh, training sessions. Now, each training session does have to read data. It also does, you know, random augmentations and so forth to data. And all of that is included in MLPerf timing, right? So uh, MLPerf sort of time benchmarking starts from the moment you start touching the data, in, you know, after whatever database you started reading after reformatting. So as soon as you touch any byte of data, uh, your clock must have been started. Thank you. Thank you, Paulus, for taking the questions. So I think there are no more unanswered questions. If you have any follow-up questions, please ask them through Slack and uh, we'll take care of those. Uh, that concludes the first session of our tutorial and we'll meet you after the break for a continuum. Thank you, everyone.